Hi, everybody. Welcome to College Chats. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Dylan Fitzpatrick. Dylan, thank you so much for hopping on. Do you have anything to say before we start? Not really. Thank you for having <laughs> me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> the icebreaker, the awkward question. Yeah, man. If you could kind of give us a background of who you are. I kind of start with this question with everybody because students that are watching get to understand and know you. Sure. So... I'm a junior studying finance here at San Diego State alongside you, originally from the Bay Area, not your classic Silicon Valley Bay, much more the boring suburbs. Grew up in an immigrant household, dad is from Ireland, mom is from Peru, it was very cool seeing two different perspectives growing up, and then came down to San Diego for university with an interest in markets and investing, but was soon red-pilled when I actually accidentally took a one-unit entrepreneurship class that business majors are required to take, was recommended to read The Lean Startup, thought it was super interesting, became very fascinated by how you can take a very methodical approach to building something new. And the whole build, measure, learn framework was, was pretty interesting. From there, took my interest in finance and that spark for, for startups and was fortunate enough to intern for an SMB SaaS startup, actually coming out of San Diego State's incubator. That was an awesome experience. It was building out some pretty simple models in preparation for fundraising, then got to learn a lot about product and go to market. And then from there, took my background in finance and then that whole startup experience. And then had a crossover between the two, found venture capital and been very fortunate to, to work for a few funds in prop tech, fintech, and retail tech. And now just learning more and more about B2B software and hoping to start my career in the growth stages of software investing. Yeah, that was a great summation of front to end, where you started, where you are now. But I do want to kind of get to know why exactly you chose to come to SDSU. And you probably already told me this a billion times, but San Diego isn't crazy a target place for, for venture, like old school venture for banking, for finance. So it was kind of the reasoning that you chose this school with the other schools that you applied to and why ultimately did you end up choosing state? Yeah. So in choosing state, I actually didn't even know the difference between a target and a non-target when it came to <laughs> my finance careers. Yeah. And to add on to that, I was actually picking which university I wanted to attend for undergrad during COVID. So it was this black hole. I was deciding between the University of Washington, UC Davis, Cal Poly Slow, and UW. I was basically priced out of, couldn't afford it. UC Davis is farm town, a little too close to home. And so it came down to slow versus San Diego State. And for those of you who don't know, they're very, very similar schools. And honestly, a big sell was the city of San Diego versus slow. Slow is pretty isolated, whereas San Diego, you can do pretty much anything. But there was actually one interesting moment that drew me to SDSU. I attended this webinar hosted by Bernard Schroeder, who was the oh, ex-director. Lavin? Of, yeah, of the Lavin Entrepreneurship Center. He talked about the Lavin program as well as the Zip Launchpad, which is SDSU's student incubator for new companies. I don't know. It was like something clicked. The program was seemed super cool, learning how to go from zero to one in the classroom setting and then having something like Zip to apply that and actually building something new. From then, fell into that entrepreneurship class, and then fell into that little internship for a startup. And so... It was a domino effect that I did not truly understand the power of, but was something that definitely pulled me to, to San Diego State. How? But I mean, aren't there other schools that also have incubators? Yeah. Is it just the right time kind of a thing? 100%. I honestly didn't know that a lot of schools, well, I would actually say San Diego State's on-campus startup ecosystem is pretty robust, mm -hmm. uh, but you're totally right. A lot of other schools have that. And so I think it was a combination of me not knowing that. And then two, as you said, right place, right time just felt right. And looking back on it definitely was the right decision. Don't regret it at all. Very happy at SDSU. And so very, very lucky that that worked out because you're, you're totally right. Yeah. I do believe in the power of successful ignorance. ignorance <laughs> but trying to do something very hard before knowing that it's hard. I feel like can get people like, an unthinkable amount of success that they wouldn't have imagined if they had done it first, looked back and been like, whoa, why did I even start this journey? You know what I'm talking about? I just wanted to add to that point, relating that to venture capital investing. There <laughs> are 
<laughs> very technical product oriented investors that I've been following and have been listening to online via podcast, et cetera. And there's a talk about how when you learn to build products in a particular space over and over again, and you switch to the investing side of the table, you become a pessimist and really dive into the nitty gritty about why something won't work versus if you haven't done that, you have the ignorance is bliss mindset to where you believe more in the possibilities and not in the in the probabilities. And so that's also a super interesting thing to think about in terms of how ignorance can lead to luck when it comes to very, very early stage venture investing. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, what do you think about what you used to do in terms of investing, which is the public equity side? I feel like everybody coming into college had this little hobby of, hey, I, I just turned 18. I could start investing. I'm going to be rich next year by putting in $100, right? So that's kind of what I thought, but I don't know how your experience was with that. Yeah, 100%. I used to think <laughs> investing was just throwing money into singular stocks. Didn't even understand mutual funds and, and ETFs and the broader landscape of alternatives with real estate, private equity, growth, venture, fixed income. It, it's interesting to think about how all of those asset classes differ and the skills that you need to get into those asset classes. And that's what I really love about finance. At the end of the day, I think there are different uh, little segments that fits everyone's personal interests. Yeah, I remember I used to li literally wake up freshman year, I think 6 a.m. every single day for six months to a seven months. Every day trader day back. To literally, yeah, to, to try to trade my way up from $100 to $1,000. Wow. I, at one point, portfolio was at $150, and then it went to like $5. And so it wasn't the greatest experience, but... I'm glad I also that. dabbled with day trading and swing trading and soon found that it, it wasn't for me and, and technical <laughs> charts aren't the end all be all are almost irrelevant when it comes to in, in investing from a retail perspective. Yeah. Now, now looking at it from an institutional perspective, right? Can you talk about how you kind of got into learning the skill sets of what an institutional investor, even though it might be for public equities, what an institutional investor would do? from some of the stuff you've done in clubs, projects, anything? Yeah, so from a super high level, again, this is something that I haven't just le learned in clubs and from you know talking to people who are in sort of institutional money manager slash advisory roles, but also in classes, just the principle of asset allocation versus security selection and 90% of your returns are, are driven by the asset classes, which you choose and not the actual in security under the umbrella of those asset classes. Because at the end of the day, when there are upswings or drawdowns in the market, all of those individual securities within those asset classes will be intercorrelated in how they're impacted with performance. And so whenever you talk to an institutional money manager outside of head funds with particular strategies, but just from a super high level, asset allocation is always more important than individual security selection. So if you're trying to decide between AMD versus NVIDIA at the end of the day, it won't really matter. And sure, you have those cases of Apple from 2000 to 2023 and how $100 would compound year over year. But again, that's a one in a million kind of case. So retail investors probably shouldn't be worrying about with company to invest in specifically. Yeah. I kind of want to get an understanding of how you chose. I don't know if this was, this was intentional or this was, again, kind of taking it step by step and what felt natural, but how did you choose to navigate your college experience so far, starting as a freshman with classes, extracurricular involvement, health? I know you're into health a lot, running and stuff, fitness, just everything about that. What was that process? Good question. So I guess I'll start with extracurricular slash clubs because that's probably the most important thing when it comes to building a good college experience. And so one thing that I really regretted in high school was not getting as involved. And so coming into college, that was my one goal. And so the f I was unfortunately virtual for my first year, but joined Entrepreneur Society, Finance and Investment Society, I think even Real Estate Society, and was constantly attending meetings to hear insights from those who have done it, 
as well as get to know people within those organizations. Unfortunately, since it was COVID, that was pretty hard to do. And so the ball didn't really get rolling until my sophomore year when things shifted in person. But I ended up choosing FIS as a member, which is the finance and investment society at San Diego State. Also joining a business fraternity called Delta Sigma Pi, just for not only that professionalism aspect, but also for the community aspect. And so those two orgs were pretty instrumental in growing myself personally and professionally. And then from there, when when it came to classes, I've always aimed to be a pretty solid student. And a lot of those slash intro to business classes were pretty interesting from a personal perspective. So I always strive to do pretty well in there. And in pursuing a career in finance, I think it's all about building facts for yourself and the higher GPA you have, it'll only help you. And so it's just not something that I really wanted to worry about. And I thought if I do well in my classes, I'll learn more, get better grades. It's only going to be a win-win. And then yeah, when it, when it comes to health, wasn't super healthy in high school, didn't really care about what went into my body and how I treated my body. And then was definitely bearing the effects of that during COVID. And so coming into college, definitely wanted to change that. Gone into long distance running. It's my favorite hobby now. I try to do it just about every day. Great way to clear my head, de-stress, build up my heart health. And that only extends to my performance as a student and as a soon to be professional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, I personally think, yeah, COVID must have been tough for you as a freshman because of the fact that you were a freshman. I think it hit me when I was a sophomore. So I had that one year of experience prior to it hitting me. So I had something to look forward to once it was over, if that made sense. Whereas for you, did you really know what you were going to get into because of the fact that it was your first year that COVID hit and you're like, well, now I don't really know what's going to happen next. Is this going to happen for the next four years? I mean, what were your kind of thoughts during COVID? Yeah, it's a good question. Looking back on it, I honestly don't remember too well. I was probably just focused semester by semester. And Mm -hmm. so when I looked at it from that perspective, it was what class am I taking? How can I do well in these? What clubs can I be involved in? And how can I start preparing for future internships and whatnot? And so I was just going through it on a semester basis, but also also curious to understand pre-COVID back, I didn't know you, but I I do know that you were involved in E3 business Uh. slash an environmentalism club here at SCSU. (laughs) And then maybe how COVID shifted you into finance more specifically, and then now banking and now even entrepreneurship, but maybe going back to day one. Okay. So I was in E3 and I joined E3 primarily because I was under the impression that a great student needs to be in a club. So I'm going to join this club and see what it's about. Join the club, saw what it's about left in two months, but I did keep the shirt. It was a fire shirt with a good logo. The reason I didn't like it was because I was just coming in to see speakers, hear about them saving the environment. And I'm like, that's cool. But I also have quotas to me in terms of financial. When I graduate, I need to want to have a career in my mind. I hope to also get a full-time job in my mind. So given that I literally had to Google, what do I have to do to make a lot of money in finance or in business? And banking came up. So I was like, okay, I'll just, what did you, What was it, the, the term you coined? It was like blissful ignorance. I was just like, okay, investment banking. Oh, I know banks and I know how to invest. So I'm just going to go straight into it. And then that's how I got into that. And then FIS was pivotal because that helped me kind of understand that it was not investing and then banking in in an and structure. It was more so Mm -hmm. a completely different thing, but that's kind of the little journey there for you. Just because I don't want to keep talking forever and ever about this weird journey. I want to understand what was the hardest thing you had to do at state so far? There are a couple of things that come to mind and I'll actually say both of them because I think both. Yeah. I I think both are pretty crucial. So first from a project standpoint and a singular thing, it was the CFA research challenge. (laughs) And so for, for those of you who don't know, it's essentially this equity research competition in which your local CFA society gives you a company to produce and invest a memo on. And you have a couple of months to do so. And I was on a team with Beck and a few other students that were involved in the Finance and Investment Society here at State. And I actually never taken an upper division finance class before doing so. 
And so I did have yeah. the benefit of being a part of FIS and have having it done stock pitch competitions before, understood the the basics of valuing companies from an absolute and relative standpoint and generally how to look at a public company and determine if it's underpriced or overpriced. But I honestly can't even put into words how hard the competition was, just given how <laughs> granular you had to get when building out a three statement model and correlating that to a DCF and comps and then getting super. So we actually had Callaway Golf as our company and just getting super granular into the industry dynamics. There was a point over break and to which I was working on it for eight to 10 hours a day for, for two weeks straight. I felt like I was a banker. I totally thrown away my, my social life. But what was really cool is our whole team was really in it to win it. And in coming from San Diego State and competing against other schools who we were told to be a bit higher ranking in terms of finance programs, I think just got us fired up and formed that camaraderie and pushed us to work really hard in, in, in making a, a super, super strong report. And so probably my proudest moment in terms of winning the local competition, but yeah, just the sheer grind of, of getting through the, the research and building the report was the hardest thing by far that I've ever done here. And then the second hardest thing is, is probably actually rejecting an amazing opportunity. Ooh. And so there was a point to where I actually had the chance to run for president of uh, my business fraternity that I mentioned earlier, Delta Sigma Pi. Yep. And I was at this crossroads to where I had a lot of people supporting me, which was really, really nice, but wasn't totally bought into it just because I had other things on my plate and had found an interest in, in venture capital and really wanted to spend time with what I'm most passionate about. And while that organization was instrumental to my professional development, I've met a lot of great people, didn't really align with where my goals were moving forward from taking on that huge responsibility. And so it was just super hard to have something you know, laid on to a silver platter. That would just be an awesome leadership experience, obviously a great resume, resume builder, and just moving away from that mindset and rejecting something like that to focus what I find really interesting was super hard to do in the moment, but probably one of the best decisions I've ever made in terms of not stretching myself too thin and really focusing on what, what matters to me personally. Yeah, I have two comments for one for the topic of CFA. What cracked me up is the one, the the sleep deprived hours where we would just start laughing about the most random stuff. And then your 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 little profile logo, the the, the you know what I'm talking about, the ice. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like I would I would hear the voice, the, the voice green little circle light up, and then it's that ice age kid profile picture talking. It's like it's like why is it, why is it circular? Why is this not working? This model is not working. And it was like the craziest moments. Of, that was the best moments, honestly. But it, it's weird how the team just came together. It was rough at first, especially from my end, because I was taking so long to understand how the model works. And at the end, it's everything clicked together. And I, I, I'm not even sure what other team could have been constructed to get that win. Second comment I had was when you mentioned... Oh yeah, the the president thing. I felt similar, but obviously it wasn't that big of a of an issue for from my end. It was the FIS thing. It's my natural progression. It almost felt oh I should probably try to do presidency or whatever. But then I'm just like no, I feel like I only have two more semesters to go. So I feel like it would have been a better use of my time if I just or technically one more semester to go. Better use of my time to explore these different avenues of the startup ecosystem. But that's how I related to that. Now that I've hit on startup ecosystem, what you do now is super, I, I think a lot of people can get value out of, but what is your experience now being involved with the student run fund Crescent? And then maybe you can slowly transition into JMIs. Yeah. So, I mean, actually in terms of getting involved with Crescent, so I was interning at a fund in LA and the important thing to note about venture is that it's definitely concentrated. And so everyone in particular areas, the San Diego startup ecosystem, LA, Silicon Valley, New York, everyone knows each other. And so that fund had actually invested into a company called Kona, which is essentially B2B software focused on mental health for employees and large corporations. And Crescent had actually also participated in that round because that company was based out of UCLA. And so learn about Crescent through that. I actually cold messaged one of the founders and hopped on a call with him. The conversation went pretty well. And then from there, I just hit it off, talked to more people and ended up 
making the decision to join at the end of last summer. So coming up on about a year in terms of my involvement with Crescent. But essentially the thesis, well, Crescent is an early stage venture fund, a micro fund that invests into startups sprouting from the Southern California university ecosystem. And so those are current students, recent dropouts, recent alumni, et cetera, with the thesis that this geography is the densest with young entrepreneurial talent from a university perspective. We have the highest concentration of some of the best engineering schools, some amazing business programs. And yet when you look at venture dollars going to these students slash young entrepreneurs, that's very much concentrated in Silicon Valley, New York. And mm. so our founders who were emerging investors and entrepreneurs had felt that problem more personally and basically said, hey, screw it, we're going to raise some money and use that to support innovation at the earliest days on university campuses to help these very, very, very smart kids go from zero to one and build something with meaningful capital behind them. And so the other thing that's important to note is our check sizes aren't that huge just because it's been very, very hard to raise a fund as students. So it's around 20 to 50K. But then the idea is to support a for form our own conviction, be the first check in and then syndicate those rounds to our LPs or advisors who are really, really interested in SoCal student deal flow. And so yeah, that's that's the, uh, the thesis on Crescent. We've invested into a little over 10 companies so far across you know, different business models and, and sectors, just with the one criteria that founders from this SoCal University ecosystem are the future. Mm -hmm. And then you keep mentioning these, these, these phrases, these terms from books, but you got to Got to speak those books out loud. The zero to one, you mentioned Lean Startup. What is the Fitzpatrick lineup of reads and maybe podcasts too, since you mentioned that earlier on? Yeah, so this one's a little controversial because the All In podcast has come under fire with the recent Silicon Valley Bank news and how they reacted to it. But nonetheless, the All In podcast is a great weekly hour-long listen from venture investors across the funding life cycle. They talk about pretty interesting topics relating to government, politics, economics, business, tech, pretty much everything you can think of and relate it back to the venture capital ecosystem. And they each have very, very different viewpoints on things. And so I think the intellectual honesty and diversity of thought is, is pretty cool to hear because you can't find that very much these days. And then another great one is Acquired. It goes through the companies in the world, not just tech companies, but also Walmart, Louis Vuitton. And you understand how they, how these management teams strategically build these companies from day one. And... Another great podcast is 20 VC by Harry Stebbings. He just has the most amazing lineup of guests, both entrepreneurs, investors, product leaders, sales, salespeople. That one's amazing. I would also recommend that. But then for books, I mean, as you said, zero to one, I think everyone should read that at least once in their life. And then outside of that, the lean startup, if what entrepreneurship is, but maybe not what goes into building a company, I think that is an feels awesome like a little, It's a little bit denser from what I've read so far. It has more, it goes a little deeper than, than zero to one. I feel like zero to one is a little bit more cool. philosophical, passionate <laughs> out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I've personally gone through maybe half of lean startup about probably 60 percent of it and then finish zero to one as far as other venture books i have not looked into that but maybe i'll look into the podcasts but kind of going I'm a big podcast guy love yeah. listening to podcasts while i run i'm not too big of yeah. a reader i wish i was though mm -hmm. we kind of talked about the traditional venture ecosystem but now i want to kind of get into more traditional what's well, not even traditional but more the growth equity side of it because you do have expressed interest in that as well through JMI. What was that process like? How did you reach out to JMI? Yeah. So I actually also learned about JMI through that fund that I learned about Crescent because they were early stage investors. Wow. It's crazy. At the end of the day, there aren't that many startups that get big institutional funding. And so when they do, there's usually always someone that you are at least two or three degrees away from who also participated. But yeah, so they, they participated in, in Butterfly MX's, one of their very early rounds, essentially their software for property managers to manage 
large multifamily student housing offices, et cetera. And JMI actually ended up leading their Series D, I think. And so again, came about them through that. And applying, I actually cold applied, but sent a cover letter that was structured <laughs> like an investment memo about wow. why why JMI should invest in the Dylan Fitzpatrick Series B. No way. Yeah. Yeah. And dude, um, that's creative. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, wow. hey, yeah, I, I can get into that later. But essentially, was given the risk reward asymmetry, some traction, blah, 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 blah. I should invest a, a summer analyst position into him. Yeah. So from there, it, it, it's a classic recruiting process. The one recommendation I would give is to just understand B2B software really well. And um, there's a lot that goes into the levers of that business model how products are actually built and deployed. And the nice thing is there are so many resources online from Bessemer, Insights, OpenView, a bunch of different growth investors in software that I'm forgetting. And so just leverage a lot of those to really understand metrics, what makes a great software business, especially more from a vertical perspective is enterprise software becomes more verticalized. And so, yeah, really leverage those online resources to prepare. You know, also my background in early stage venture, I thought was kind of interesting because when you think about synergies across investors, the early stage investors have an incentive to build relationships with growth stage investors to pass along their portfolio companies as they raise more and more capital later in the company lifestyle cycle. And so that's how I was thinking about things in terms of my network and what I could bring to the table, because something to note is that growth equity usually recruits out of banking. So those who work on very late stage capital raises, M&A, IPOs. And so I didn't have that and just thought about how I could leverage my experiences to add value. Even as a summer analyst, not going to add too much value, but in, in the long run, how I was thinking about things. And yeah, so I mean, happy to answer more questions about that process, but that was, that was pretty much it at a high level and what I think made me successful. Yeah, I mean, I can... I can speak to the creativity of it because have you heard other people trying that too? Like constructing a memo of yourself to apply. That's interesting. That's, that's crazy. That's like I, I don't know. I I don't even know yeah. how I came up with it to be honest. I think yeah. I was just. I think I was actually reading. So Bessemer Venture Partners has a bunch of memos from companies like Yelp, LinkedIn, Twitch mm. that they publicly released and, and and published online. And I think one day I was reading through those as I was getting into growth the growth equity recruiting process, and I was like. Hey, these could be written about a person. Why not me? And then so I, I, very, very hubris, but wrote it about myself because got to stand out one way or another. Yeah. One cool concept you did touch on is the degrees of so focal points where everything is connected. Goes back to what I've read recently about some law of six degrees of separation. Have you heard of that? Have I told you this before? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's so exactly what I was talking this about. This mind-blowing thing where apparently you are the first focal point and you're trying to reach another person, any person, it doesn't matter, anywhere in the world. And all it takes is four people in the middle to reach the sixth focal point, which is the person you want to reach, which is crazy. That's just opened my mind to the potential of talking to people and networking and just understanding their POVs. So that was an interesting thing you brought up. But... This kind of been dragging on a very long time to wrap up, to give students that want to maybe go into the route of venture, go into the route of understanding startups and go into the route of growth equity. What would you say to them? What are some tips, advice, best practices of the Dylan Fitzpatrick method? So first of all, I live by this quote luck is when opportunity meets preparation. And so at the end of the day, I just strive to put myself in environments to where there will be opportunities one way or another. And you can think of that, at it, that as joining a club, getting involved in the exec board. But then the other side to it is that opportunities are worthless if you're not prepared for them to come. And so I just view that as you can learn finance in class, but outside of that, what are you going to do 
to make sure that you're so prepared so that when you get in an, in an interview room, you're just so good that that no one can ignore you. And given that there are just so many resources online today, even as a freshman, you can kickstart that in watching a YouTube video as how to build a DCF or reading a Bessemer investment memo or diving into insights, SaaS, KPI metrics, and doing that extra work so that when those opportunities arise, you're extremely prepared. And one, those opportunities will be a function of luck, but at least you'll be very, very prepared to capture that luck. I, you know? Okay. I thought it was the uh, create value, deliver value, capture value. I thought that was that. No. Yeah. I, I could see how that was, that was the, the case there, but unfortunately not this time. So yeah. And then the last thing in relation to venture and growth equity, there's so many pieces of advice, but the one thing is that this is a people-based industry. And so at the end of the day, your ability to be a great investor is dictated by who, what you can only get you so far in terms of, I'm super deep into fintech. I really understand B2B payments. But at the end of the day, if you don't know people who are building in B2B payments, then that's irrelevant. And so I just like to think of it from a standpoint of venture capital firms and funds live and die by their deal flow. And so the one actionable thing that anyone can do is meet people. And so meet investors, meet founders, meet program directors of accelerators, incubators, and build that network so that one, you can generate deal flow. Two, you can tap into that network when you need to help with diligence or even portfolio company support. And yeah, so I think to sum it up, build yourself up from a perspective of what, you, so for example, if I'm really passionate about the housing crisis, maybe I'm going to look at prop tech and how we can facilitate more housing infrastructure, new developments, how we can make it easier to find these affordable properties, how we can better finance these properties from a consumer perspective and then build up that domain expertise and then leverage that by meeting a bunch of investors saying, hey, here's my thesis here. So I'm thinking about things. I'd love to meet you. Meet with founders like, hey, I've been doing a bunch of research here. We'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm a student or you know, different ecosystem players. Maybe they're operators of big companies saying, hey, here's the work I've done. We'd sort of love to hear your perspective. So I think when you combine the who and what as the things that matter in this, you can find a, a lot of success. There you go, guys. That wraps it up. Thanks a lot for hopping on the podcast. Words will have tremendous value for anybody pursuing both VC growth equity, but also just general business majors, even just regular students trying to be investors in spirit, entrepreneurs in spirit. So super appreciative of you hopping on. Yeah, thanks, Beck.